here and to have this opportunity to speak with you and then to uh, respond to the questions, which I know are coming along at the end. Uh, first, I, I, I want to say just a few words at the outset about the tragic events of today. Uh, President Anwar Sadat was a gifted man and an outstanding leader uh, who brought both great vision and courage uh, to the conduct of international affairs. It was President Sadat, along with Prime Minister Begin, who helped to set in motion a real movement toward peace in the Middle East. And I think we all deeply mourn of the tragic death of this gifted man. The work which he began must now be carried forward by men of, and women of goodwill uh, throughout the world. And I think it would not be amiss if we just pause for a moment, I think, to pay our respects to the President Sadat. If I could ask you to do that, I would appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. In addressing tonight's topic, when we got together and put it together, the formulation of American foreign policy, uh, I wanted to discuss a basic question that is always before us and transcends the topical issue of the moment. I'm quite happy to go at those topical issues in the question session, but I thought it might serve some purpose given the objectives of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and the sort of thoughtful approach which it takes towards American foreign policy, uh, if we try to, to look at, at, a, at an issue that is, in a sense, always with us, that is fundamental and basic and, and an underlying issue, rather than trying to pick off of what might have appeared on today's front page or yesterday's front page and is the particular trouble area of the world at the moment. As I said, I'll be happy to address those in the, in the question period. But what I thought I would talk about this evening is the subject of the appropriate roles and in the interrelationship of the executive and the legislative branches of our national government in the formulation of U.S. foreign policy. Now, obviously, this is a matter that is a permanent item on the national agenda. And in discussing it tonight, I do not propose to offer solutions, in part because I think there are no definitive solutions to this question, uh, but rather some observations that I hope will contribute to a clearer understanding of the problems, uh, hopefully better to cope with them. Uh, let me begin by re reiterating a few basic points. Uh, first of all, it almost goes without saying that we are talking about the formulation of foreign policy and not its day-to-day -day conduct. Uh, Congress can participate in making foreign policy decisions or it can react by qualifying, restricting, or even nullifying them, but it cannot carry them out on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it can conduct oversight. It can reject certain proposals made by, by the president, but it cannot uh, on a daily basis, actually conduct American foreign policy. And I think it's very important to underscore that at the outset. Uh, secondly, where foreign policy is concerned, as indeed where many other governmental powers are concerned, the Constitution prescribes not a complete separation of powers, but an intermingling of executive and congressional responsibility. As Richard Neustadt put it in his work, Presidential Power, ours is a government of separate institutions sharing power. Whereas Professor Edwin Corwin said nearly 40 years ago, the Constitution of the United States is, and I quote, an invitation to struggle for the privilege of directing American foreign policy. End of quote. The president is obviously commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but Congress raises and supports armies, provides and maintains the Navy, makes the rules for governing land and naval forces, and has the power to declare war. The president makes treaties and appoints ambassadors, but in both instances, 
with the advice and consent of the Senate, and in the case of treaties, with the requirement of an extraordinary majority of two-thirds. The President, through his representatives, may negotiate trade agreements, clearly a significant aspect of foreign policy, but the Constitution assigns to the Congress the responsibility to regulate commerce with foreign nations. Thirdly, the constitutional provisions regarding foreign policy, in part ambiguous or inconclusive because they were intended to be, are the, mo are the more so because the very nature of international relations has been significantly transformed in this century, indeed in the last several decades. Today, the line between many international and domestic issues is so indistinct that the political scientist Bayless Manning has added to the language the phrase intermestic issues. One can only imagine what H.L. Mencken's reaction would have been to such abuse of the English language. The health of the national economy increasingly depends on our foreign trade, on the availability of certain raw materials at reasonable prices. Our ability to export, for example, with respect to agricultural pro uh, products, exports now account for approximately one-fourth to one-third of our entire agricultural output. The question of maintaining armed forces here and more acutely abroad is a budgetary as well as a national security matter of major importance. What are regarded as legitimate environmental standards within the United States become controversial non-tariff barriers when attached to trade agreements. In short, the constitutional guidelines for the formulation of foreign policy must be adapted to meet conditions which did not exist and could not have been foreseen 200 years ago. Fourth, particularly in view of the increased blurring of the demarcation of foreign and domestic issues, we should take note of the extensive steps taken in this decade to reform congressional procedures, changes which were made almost entirely for internal institutional reasons, but which have had a significant impact upon the making of foreign policy. Among these are the Legislative Reorganization Act, the House Committee reforms, the Senate Committee reforms, reforms dealing with the seniority system and the diffusing of authority in both the Senate and more especially in the House. So the Congress today functions as a very different institution than a decade or two decades ago. And this markedly affects how policy is made and how the executive and the Congress interact. Fifth, there is a question of mutual trust and good faith between the branches of government. The Founding Fathers were, of course, highly skeptical of a concentration of power, and they really designed a system which did not have peaceful coexistence between the executive and the legislative branches as an objective. While this made possible stalemate, they feared more errors, errors of commission rather than errors of omission. Both the federal system and the separation of powers, the two great governmental principles embraced in our Constitution, reflect this skepticism about the concentration of power. At the same time, however, the balanced mechanism of our system of government assumes an element of good faith on the part of those carrying out its functions. And structural arrangements alone are not adequate to compensate for the lack of such good faith. The Indochina and the Watergate experiences seriously undermine not only the confidence of the American people in their government, but also of one branch of the government in the other. And those experiences engendered attitudes which have not completely faded. Let me now turn from these general observations to consider several congressional efforts in recent years to introduce guidelines channel markers within which the executive is expected to navigate, which have markedly increased the role of the Congress in the making of foreign policy. And this, the ones I'm going to mention, I think, are among the more important ones, but they are by no means the entire list. 
The first is the War Powers Act, enacted over a presidential veto in 1973, which requires the president to report on the use of armed forces, requires their withdrawal within a certain number of days in the absence of congressional approval, or in an earlier period if Congress disapproves, requires consultation with the Congress, places certain limitations upon uh, the executive's use of armed forces. Now, some opponents of the act have contended that rather than limiting or controlling the executive, it, e it authorizes or e even invites the president to commit armed forces to action without any reference to the Congress. Senator Eagleton has made this point in particularly pointed fashion. The War Powers Act has been brought into play five times since its passage. Four times in the spring of 1975 in connection with U.S. actions in Southeast Asia, including the Mayaguez incident, and the fifth time in connection with the abortive effort to rescue the American hostages in Iran. In each case, the basic requirements for executive congressional consultation were complied with after the fact, so that I think it's fair to say that the consultation became, in effect, reporting. And this has led skeptics to pass quick and harsh judgment on the act. In my view, too quick and too harsh. There is another side of the coin to be considered. Those actions which the executive did not undertake or undertook in a more prudent way than might otherwise have been the case precisely because of the obligations toward the Congress which the act imposes on the executive executive branch. The former Assistant Secretary of State, Douglas Bennett, has said that the act, and I quote, has conditioned the executive branch's decision-making process in military crisis. Perhaps the most notable case in point lies earlier this year with respect to El Salvador. With the dispatch by the administration of military advisors to that beleaguered nation, the question immediately arose in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee whether the provisions of the act were being complied with and applied. And it was clear to the members of the committee upon questioning executive branch representatives that that question had obviously been raised and thoroughly reviewed within the executive branch and that the proposal that was being made as to what was to be done was put before us that in a way that tracked the War Powers Act very closely in terms of not overstepping what it was generally accepted uh, was the executive discretion in the circumstances. It is fair to suggest, I think, that whatever the difficulties which arise in meeting the requirements of the Act, uh, particularly when the introduction of U.S. military personnel is designed for a specific action, over a short period of time that it has had a beneficial cautionary effect. And I want to reemphasize again the number of instances which may never have risen uh, to public view in which the, the act has had some impact. The second is the CASE Act dealing with the reporting of executive agreements, which while attracting less public attention actually predated the War Powers Act. The CASE Act, as some of you will recall, requires the President to submit all international agreements to Congress. The prior legislation only required an annual publication of all treaties and agreements made the previous year. But the Secretary of State, under that legislation, was allowed to omit from that list submitted to the Congress those agreements he judged to be sensitive to national security. The CASE Act required that Congress be notified of all agreements with a provision for continued secrecy of those judged sensitive. During and after World War II, the executive agreement came into use as a device suspected by many as a way of avoiding treaties which require Senate examination and approval. By 1972, the U.S. had become party to 947 treaties and 4,359 executive agreements. Some of these agreements were minor, but others involved commitments, for example, to trade ships for military base rights, Roosevelt's destroyer trade with Britain in 1940, 
to supply military and economic aid in return for bases, Spain and the Philippines and others. Although Congress has never acted to require legislative approval in some form of the executive agreements, although there have been a number of proposals to that effect, the question remains sensitive enough that a suggestion at one point to have the SALT II take the form of an executive agreement was discarded in the face of strong congressional and public protest. A third of these guidelines is the Nelson Amendment to the Foreign Military Sales Act, which requires congressional approval, congressional review of certain major sales of U.S. military equipment abroad and provides for congressional veto of such sales. This was, as you will recall, if you think back, a major reaction by Congress to the perception that the United States was becoming a major factor in the world arms race by unrestricted sales abroad of its weapons. There was no single event precipitating the amendment which Senator Nelson had proposed several times in similar forms before it passed in 1974. But the amendment has served as an important vehicle to focus attention and debate on an area of foreign policy, military sales, which has become increasingly important, particularly as direct military aid and direct U.S. Armed Forces commitments abroad have been reduced. And in my judgment, obviously, the military sales area promises to become even more important in the future. Together with other related amendments on reporting arms sale, the Nelson Amendment provides a very important source of data enabling the Congress to make better informed judgments. Fourth is the human rights requirements which have been written into virtually every major piece of foreign assistance legislation enacted in the last decade. Uh, beginning in the 1960s, members of Congress had sought unsuccessfully to cut off aid to specific repressive governments. The Foreign Assistance Act of 1973 took a fundamentally different approach, expressing the sense of Congress that the President deny assistance to any country in turning its citizens for political reasons. In the late 1970s, we provided for annual reporting requirements with respect to those nations which receive military aid and subsequently uh, economic aid on the state of human rights. And the country reports must assess, among other elements, the existence of any pattern of gross violation of basic human rights, defined as including torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, prolonged detention without charges, or other flagrant denial of the right to life, liberty, and the security of person. The Congress, which itself embraces a wide range of opinion on the role of human rights in foreign policy, was attempting with these provisions to find a responsible approach to the subject. Many members wanted a more stringent standard. Others thought that human rights did not belong in foreign aid legislation at all. Still others wanted certain countries singled out while other members wanted to avoid singling out any countries. These divisions continue today within the Congress and between the Congress and the executive branch and presumably throughout the country. And no issue is probably more delicate or complicated than the one of human rights in foreign policy. Now, I think these examples serve to illustrate recent steps taken by the Congress to redress what was generally perceived to be a serious imbalance in the foreign policy making process. Have they proved to be full or perfect solutions to our problem? Of course not. They could not be. Separately and together, they represent the attempt not to conduct foreign policy, but to set guidelines for its conduct, to establish the broad channels within which the executive then acts. Of the various approaches, perhaps the one with the greatest possibilities properly used is the legislative veto. It leaves formulation of major foreign policy initiative with the executive while giving the Congress a formal opportunity to review the proposal. 
It makes possible a full congressional and equally important, a full public exposition of the issue. It encourages consultation by the executive with the relevant committees and with concerned members. And I would point out that the decision to exercise the veto or not and the reasons for it put the Congress on public record where it can be held accountable. The device of the legislative veto underscores a fundamental point on which I believe there is general agreement. And that is that Congress should not attempt to deal with foreign policy matters on a daily basis. That the leeway for congressional action is to some extent necessarily limited. The advice and consent to treaties negotiated by the executive, a Senate prerogative set out in the Constitution. The legislative veto, a, recently, recent, a relatively recent development that is the prerogative of the two houses and may in fact go to the Supreme Court now for the court's review and adjudication. Control over appropriations, an increasingly important aspect of our foreign policy. The alternatives available to the Congress are necessarily limited. This is an aspect of congressional decision making of which members are acutely aware but which the public does not often fully appreciate. And let me offer you just a small example of that from my own experience with the Senate debate on the Panama Canal Treaties. A young man came running up to me in the Capitol one day and something like the following conversation ensued. He said to me, he said, Senator, the treaties are a fraud and a delusion. They are designed to perpetuate American military control of the canal forever. And so I said to him, you think I should oppose the treaties? And he said, I believe the canal should be turned over to the United Nations. The treaties will only enable the United States to continue its military and economic domination of the canal and of Latin America. And I said, well, then you're asking me to vote against the treaties. And he said, I didn't say that. <laughs> and therein lies the dilemma. Issues do not always present themselves in the form that we would find most congenial to deal with. Panama Canal issue was not what to do with a canal in terms of putting it under UN control. It was quite simply whether the Senate should approve two treaties negotiated by our own government and the Panamanian government over the course of some 15 years. I would make the same point to you about congressional action on war powers, on executive agreements, on military sales, on human rights, and on other issues. The question we must ask is this, should the Congress refrain altogether from addressing these vital issues which lie at the core of our foreign policy? Would the country be better off today if the guidelines which are in place in these areas had not been enacted. And as a member of Congress, let me ask you to put yourselves in my position and consider this question. Would Americans today, by and large, countenance a Congress that refused to address these issues? In other words, if the question is put in each area, either a response will be forthcoming or you simply will have absented yourself from the decision-making process. I'm actually tempted to conclude my remarks with that question, leading you, leaving you to provide answers rather than questions in the, in the time remaining to us. But instead, let me conclude with the following brief observations, and they are really reminders. What some people might call truisms, but I think it's important to remind ourselves from time to time. First, we live in a democratic society, and in the end, foreign policy cannot be conducted in secret. In my judgment, foreign policy decisions over the long run cannot be made without reference to, or even more urgently, an actual defiance of the convictions of the people of this nation. This does not mean that the executive should or does determine the lines of a policy, or that Congress should or does react to it on the basis of public opinion surveys which have become really the surrogate of the referendum. It does mean that while these decisions can be made so long as public opinion remains indifferent 
Ultimately, they cannot be made in defiance of an aroused public opinion. Vietnam is a stunning case in point, but it is not the only one. And President Roosevelt, who faced that problem himself in the years leading up uh, to World War II, said just prior to the 1940 election, echoing Jefferson, and I quote, Dictators have forgotten, or perhaps they never knew, the basis upon which democratic government is founded, that the opinion of all the people, freely formed and freely expressed, without fear or coercion, is wiser than the opinion of any one man or any small group of men. Secondly, our form of government is not a parliamentary system. This is precisely what the separation of powers is all about. We must therefore work with what we have, striving to bring our system into balance while recognizing that a, at any given moment an element of imbalance may be inevitable and in some circumstances even desirable. We should not despair over the failure of the executive and the Congress to agree on a substantive matter. We should not be afraid to recognize a disagreement between the branches, disagreement within the Congress generally reflects a lack of consensus in the nation, whether the issue at hand is tax policy, energy policy, or foreign policy. And finally, we must remind ourselves that a balancing act is not a tug of war. Where foreign policy, or indeed all major policy decisions are concerned, we are not, or should not be, talking about the aggrandizement of one branch of government at the expense of the other. Policy making is not a pie where more for one means less for the other. Writing over 20 years ago as a public spirited citizen with considerable experience in the executive branch, Dean Acheson admonished us, and I quote, the central question is not whether the Congress should be stronger than the presidency or vice versa but how the Congress and the Presidency can both be strengthened to do the pressing work that falls to each to do and to both to do together. Thank you very much. Well, we certainly thank you, Senator Sarbanes, for your thoughtful commentary on the process in which you're so importantly involved. The Senator has agreed to answer questions at the end of the session in about 10 minutes after 9. Um, yes. Senator, what effect will well, it's probably too early to give any definitive answers to that kind of question. I want to, I mean, I think that this, uh, the tragic death of Sadat is a tremendous loss because obviously he represented a great vision and great courage and had taken some very bold steps in an effort to bring about peace. Now, uh, the reports we have are that the transition in uh, in Egypt is proceeding um, um, in an orderly fashion. Of course, is a you know an, an immediate uh, concern. Um, the Vice President Mubarak has went on television and announced uh, first the instituted martial law for a one-year period. The existing cabinet will stay. Under their constitutional provisions, the People's Assembly must now meet uh, to arrange for, for an election of a new president, and they've now scheduled a meeting uh, for tomorrow. Uh, in the course of his appearance, the vice president stressed continuity in terms of the Egyptian government. They stressed the, uh, the importance of the route to peace and of Egypt meeting its international commitments. So I mean, it's a situation we watch closely, but we obviously uh, place great stress on the continuity of U.S.-Egyptian relations and on the continuity of the, of the peace process.
Well, I think as many of you know, I have opposed that sale and I continue to do so. I actually oppose I opposed the sale of the uh, F-15s uh, two years ago. The, the current package, I think it's very important to underscore, includes not only the AWACS, but the enhancement equipment for the F-15s. That's not often mentioned. And if you go back and look at the rationale that was advanced two years ago, a rationale I did not accept, but which was accepted in the Senate for sending the F-15s, it was very much premised on the fact that they would not carry with them the very enhancement equipment which it is now being uh, proposed to send. Now, it's the largest arms sales in our history, in our history, arms sale in our history, eight and a half billion dollars. And I, I'm very frank to tell you, I think uh, it introduces uh, instability into the area rather than than stability. And I also think that the current events underscore perhaps the need for the administration to to hold that package back while they re-examine the situation. Yes. The, the, the very simple answer to that is yes, as I think Congress has been irresponsible in failing to get the appropriations bills into place. We shifted the fiscal year from July 1 to October 1 in an effort to give ourselves enough time to provide the appropriation bills for all of the departments of the federal government at the time of the beginning of the fiscal year. Actually, we are now, and this is the worst it's ever been, we don't have a single one of the, of the 13 appropriations bills in place. So the entire government at the moment is operating on a continuing resolution. We have used that tactic in the past but usually only for part of the government with the, with the appropriation bills in place. One of the problems is, of course, the appropriations bills have become the vehicle for the fighting, fighting over a whole range of issues unrelated to the level of appropriation. It's this whole problem of legislating on an appropriation bill. And so they have become the vehicle for these very extended debates and very sharp fights. But it's not an orderly way to run the government, and it's particularly marked in the foreign assistance area, where we have gone year after year not providing them with the basic underlying statutory authority. Yes? Uh, in light of uh, the way we have say on the opposition in the Senate, uh, I heard a rumor last week that if the Senate uh, voted opposition to the sale that the administration would possibly sell the AWACS anyway and challenge the Senate on that. What is your response? Well, I've not heard that, and I would be surprised if that were the case. I mean, um, you know, the statute's pretty clear. One of the points I want to make is that the uh, you know, in many of these areas, if, if the matter is really pushed, you know, we could pass legislation that would preclude the executive from making a sale without the affirmative approval of the Congress. In this area, there's not an inherent power constitutionally for the executive to make such sales. Now, what the Congress has done is rather than going that far, and this is one of the reasons I think the legislative veto um, properly developed to be a useful vehicle, is the Congress has really given to the executive a significant degree of discretion and initiative, reserving to itself the right to disapprove if the executive makes a move which the, of which the Congress is not prepared to sanction. The alternative would be not to give any of that discretion and require that, a, that approvals be, be obtained. So in a sense, it becomes an effort to provide some discretion at the same time setting up these 
markers, as I said, to, to, to channel the extent to which the executive can act on his own. Now, if they're taking a case to the Supreme Court, and I guess the argument that will be made to the court is that the Congress has to do it one way or the other. Either you give the executive the power or you don't give it to him, but you can't give it to him modified. Um, because I saw that a case was, uh, it involved a domestic issue, it's on its way to the court. Well, that's a very interesting legal problem. I think that uh, to deny the power would, as I said, would foreclose an option which I think has some very interesting possibilities for executive congressional cooperation in most instances. Occasionally, it brings about a confrontation, and differences are very sharp. Well, I'm not altogether sure exactly what undertaking the president was making when he uh, when he made that statement, and obviously. The question of intervening in the internal affairs of another country is an extremely difficult and uh, and complicated one. I mean, obviously, Egypt is very important to this peace process in the Middle East, and the breakthrough that was achieved between Begin and Sadat, and they both took enormous risks for peace. I think I think that ought to be underscored. Um, and in fact, one of my concerns with with Saudi Arabia and the constant characterization of it as a moderate regime was that it did not support that peace process. I mean, Saudi's support of that peace process would have been enormously significant. It did not happen. Uh, secondly, of course, as we know, they, they provide a extended financial support for the PLO and its which, of course, is engaged in a whole range of terrorist activities. And thirdly, and I must say this, uh, uh, it is my view that the so-called moderation in Saudi oil pricing, I mean, here I agree with Hobart Rowan, the economic uh, columnist of the Washington Post, who said that, that their oil pricing is designed to accomplish two things. One, maintain the OPEC cartel, and secondly, maintain their dominant position within the OPEC cartel. And that's, I think, if you look back, you know, at the moment they're, they're holding the price down a bit, but I think that's to assert their dominant position. The fact is that the tremendous increase in oil prices, which has taken place in less than the, the last 10 years, uh, was driven to a large extent by by the Saudis and others pushing the price of oil up in a very escalated fashion. Yes? Do you think that our foreign policy is being not fully influenced by minority ethnic groups that there's white Anglo-Saxons and Protestants from the world? Yeah. I I mean, we have a very open democracy, and I think it's legitimate uh, for any uh, organized group to, you know, to bring their uh, opinions to bear on the making of foreign policy. Uh, in many areas of the world, if it were not for populations in this country which maintain a close interest in what is happening and therefore can question what's what's taking place there with respect to American policy. The only influence that would come in to bear upon the government would be economic interest. Uh, you know, United Fruit in Central America or the copper companies in certain South American countries or the oil companies where it's... Now, you know, I think they're entitled to, to state their position and how they perceive things and what they think is what they perceive to constitute American interest, but by the same token, I think these other groups are also entitled to do so. Um, my own perception of it is that, uh, that all of these efforts to influence bend over backwards to make certain that, that the position they're putting forward squares with American interest, which is, after all, the fundamental question uh, that must be asked. 
and I think that uh, they're all entitled to, to express their position in a, in a forceful and as persuasive a manner as they can. It's up to us to, to try to listen and evaluate and then make the right decision for the sake of the country. Sir, given the uh, fact that the Camp David Accords um, depended largely on the allegiance of personality between uh, late uh, President Sadat and uh, Prime Minister Begin, given the opposition of uh, many other Arab capitals to the, uh, the initiative of, uh, of the Egyptians, given the problems that, on the local scene and domestic scene in Egypt, uh, given the unlikelihood that uh, another leader of uh, similar stature will, will rise in Egypt, do you think it's uh, very artificially optimistic to expect the, the Camp David Accords to go according to schedule now? And uh, did uh, Mr. Haig express any pessimism on that account this evening? Well, we did not really get into that subject. His own statement to us was largely recounting what transpired today and also the expectations of what would transpire in Egypt in the near future. I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question, but obviously we have to do all we can to or try to move things in the direction of being able to press forward with a Camp David uh, effort. But we have lost the, the, the leader who, who took the initiative in order to make, to make that breakthrough. I, mean, I don't minimize the severity of, or the tragedy of what has occurred. I think Sadat was an extraordinary leader. I think most people would, have, would agree with that judgment. Incidentally, it was one of the reasons why I've been such a strong supporter in the Congress of every effort to provide assistance to Egypt on the economic side and an effort. We had the, some administration people before us and went very hard at them on moving the aid through the pipeline in order to get the assistance out there. I mean, if we you know, if you really mean business, there are lots of ways to do it, but one of them is to really back to have backed Sadat up and his administration in producing tangible economic results for his people to show that this kind of initiative produces results. And we did some of that, but I don't think we put the sense of high priority and urgency on it that I think should have attached to it. Sorry, I didn't, yes. What can you see as the consequences of the peace process in well, all kinds of dire predictions are being drawn, but I must say that uh, I don't quite see that all of that is going to happen. First of all, as I indicated, it's not as though... Um, well, in 1978, it was asserted that if the F-15s went to Saudi Arabia, that we would really get some return and support for the, for the peace process. But this was the sort of peace that needed to be put into place to prove the, the litmus test of American friendship. And, of course, that did not happen. And uh, I don't perceive it as making that much of a difference, and I see the downside of it being as, a, as, a, as greatly heightening uh, the possibility of conflict in that area. One of the things it will do, I'm very interested in the sort of people who say, well, it is not really a danger to Israel because if a conflict were to come, they would immediately shoot the AWACS down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they have this superior air force and they will immediately go out and the AWACS can't travel very fast and they will shoot it down. Well, now, first of all, if there are American technicians aboard the AWACS and it is shot down in a circumstance of that sort, obviously that poses some extremely deep and serious problems, obviously. And secondly, even if that were not the case, what that would do, and what it, that kind of thinking does, is it draws Saudi Arabia, uh, makes it central to a conflict instead of peripheral, which has always been the case in past Middle East conflicts. Now, we can argue a bit about how much help and support the Saudis were providing in one way or another, but they have essentially been peripheral and not central to that conflict. Well, as soon as that happens, 
of course, they would become central to the conflict. So you've almost guaranteed that they will be drawn and drawn immediately into any conflict. Not, it seems to me, a, a, a desirable situation to have structured. Well, I think it can, obviously, and it seems to me when you're talking about sales of the kinds of magnitudes that are in the billions of dollars, there's an appropriate role for congressional decision making. I mean, if you consider what it represents in terms of potential American involvement, what it represents in terms of uh, how it affects the stability of a particular region for the United States to make billions of dollars of sales to a particular country, uh, it seems to me that that calls for some role on the part of the Congress.